Coming up next, the story behind a song that has conquered every aspect of our culture, from movies to TV to cover songs by some of the biggest artists in history, uh, to bringing humor to U.S. soldiers escaping from the drudgery of the Vietnam War. It's a track from a band that many of us wrongly assume is a one-hit wonder. Uh, it's a song loaded with hilarious off-the-cuff moments from the recording studio. Many listeners and DJs thought that this song was code for sex or something even dirtier. But the singer claims the strange title was his cat's name. It was uh, what the business calls a novelty track, but even without lyrical substance, it was the first single to sell over a million copies during the British invasion and the first song in history that barely missed the number one spot, yet still finished ahead of every band and artist of that year, one of the biggest years of music, including the Beatles and the Stones, it was the number one song of that year. Details of this tantalizing party ditty that shockingly outperformed some of the biggest songs in music history is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember toilet papering houses with your friends in your youth, you're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the big red button, click the bell, the notification bell, so you know when our latest interviews and, and videos come out. So the t-shirt of the day today, Warren Cherry Pie. <laughs> you can go get yours at 80stees.com below for a merch or uh, right up here at the link. Check it out, they have thousands of the coolest shirts you'll ever see. So 1965 was one of the most prolific years of the rock era for singles that became all-time classics. Some of the most played and recognizable songs ever recorded. Just listen to the list of songs that came out in 65. You Lost That Love and Feeling by the Righteous Brothers, Mr. Tambourine Man by the Birds, I Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Stones. You Help Me Run by the Beach Boys, I Hear a Symphony by the Supremes, uh, two of the Beatles' biggest hits, Ticket to Ride, and Yesterday, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yesterday. Would you believe me if I told you that none of those epic songs ended up as the number one song of that year? Well, it's true. That honor went to a quirky little uh, party ditty by a group that most people cannot even name. A song from a band that everybody mistakes for a one-hit wonder for sure. The number one record of one of the greatest years in music history, 1965, was none other than Wooly Bully by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. Now, Sam the Sham is actually Domingo Samudio, born to Mexican parents in Dallas. He faced a tough time early on when his mother passed away, leaving his father to raise him and his two siblings. Domingo began singing at a young age, uh, even performing for his school on a local radio contest in second grade, and then he picked up the guitar uh, soon after that. However, his music dreams were put on pause after high school when he enlisted in the U.S. Navy, and he actually served for six years and eventually he relocated to Panama. Now during his time in the military, Domingo picked up the nickname Big Sam. Uh, Sam, as I'll refer to him throughout the video, uh, he spent six years in Panama before returning to the States where he enrolled at Arlington State College. That's uh, actually now the University of Texas at Arlington to, uh, to study voice, actually. He later recalled, and I quote, I was studying classical music by day and playing rock and roll by night. That double life lasted about two years before he decided to drop out and join a traveling carnival, embracing a whole new kind of adventure. Back in Dallas in 1961, Sam formed a band he called the Pharaohs. Inspired by Yul Brenner's pharaoh costume that he wore playing Ramses in the 1956 epic The Ten Commandments. Their lives are mine. All that they own is mine. Joining him were Carl Meadke, Russell Fowler, Omar, Big Man Lopez, and Vincent Lopez, uh, no relation to Omar. In 1962, the Pharaohs recorded their first single, but it went nowhere. And before long, the group disbanded, leaving Sam searching for his next musical maneuver. 
Now, in May of 1963, Vincent Lopez landed a gig with a band called Andy and the Night Riders. Uh, this was in Louisiana. When their organist left, Sam jumped in to fill the spot. The group was made up of Andy Anderson, David A. Martin, Vincent Lopez, and now Sam. Uh, they soon became the house band at the Conga Club just outside of Leesville, Louisiana. It was there that Sam earned the nickname Sam the Sham. Uh, it was a playful jab at his supposed lack of vocal prowess. Uh, the name stuck, and a bit of self-deprecating humor became part of his onstage persona. Do anything but just scream, dance, and jump around. It's Amazing. kind of a nice life. Sam the Sham, as he was then called, became notorious for his outrageous style. Uh, he always performed in a campy robe and a turban while transporting his gear in a 1952 Packard hearse, complete with maroon velvet curtains. Very cool. <laughs> Sam and his pharaohs were signed by the trailblazing record man Sam Phillips, of course, signed to Elvis in 1964. Sam began crafting a song that was inspired by a dance craze in the early 60s called Holy Gully. Sam's idea was to write a song that would get people on the dance floor. He was originally just going to title it Holy Gully. But the folks at the record label were skeptical because uh, it was so close to a song that was already out called Holy Gully Now. That was released in 62 by uh, Bow and the Arrows, featuring Little Smitty on vocals. Watch it now, watch it now, watch it now. That song had roots in Junior Parker's Feeling Good, bringing a, a bluesy, infectious groove that stuck with Sam. Now, when Sam reworked it, he replaced Holy Gully with Wooly Bully. That was uh, what he called his cat. And he changed a few more lines along the way. But one thing he kept was the catchy, watch it, watch it now, you know, that refrain that carried over from the original tune, adding a familiar echo to the new tune. Everybody knows that one. Well, Mama told Papa about something she heard. When asked about his recollection of the impetus of Wooly Bully, uh, Sam Phillips, the record man, had a little different take. In the Memphis Music Hall of Fame note, Sam later set the record straight, saying, and I quote, People make up all kinds of stories when they don't have the right answers. There was a saying around here, when anybody did something good, we'd say, Wooly Bully. Uh, Wooly Bully for you. You know, like Big Deal or Good On You. Wooly Bully. Wooly Bully. Why did I watch? So after rhyming Holy Gully with Wooly Bully, uh, Sam began to put the song together. Uh, there wasn't much to the song lyrically, let's be honest. Much like Louie Louie, the lyrics of Wooly Bully actually baffled listeners from the very beginning. Even though there wasn't anything remotely offensive in the word structure, the fact that you know they were hard to understand led people to assume that Wooly Bully was somehow a, a dirty song, you know, pornographic, prompting many radio stations to ban it outright. People were always trying to hear hidden meanings or come up with their own translation to find controversy. There were even some people who said they heard the F word. I have no idea how anyone would get that from the lyrics of the song if you've listened to it uh, several times. The hit plays out like a playful chat between two characters, actually, Maddie and Hattie. Uh, Maddie tells Hattie about a wild sighting of a creature with two big horns and a woolly jaw. Maddie told Hattie about a thing she saw. Now, while it sounded strange enough to stir up speculation, turns out this woolly bully was Sam's way of describing an American bison or buffalo. You know, then out of nowhere, Maddie and Hattie are talking about the importance of dance moves leaving listeners to wonder how these oddball ideas tie together at all. But that randomness and that to mystery is part of the charm of Wooly Bully. It became all the more memorable for it. I mean, there isn't much to sing along to in Wooly Bully except the words Wooly or Bully, but you know, Sam managed to sneak in a bit of 60s slang that's really fun. When he sings, let's not be L7, come on, learn to dance. Uh, he's calling out anyone who's a little too square or out of touch with what's cool. L7 was shorthand for an unhip person, uh, someone not you know, really in the groove. Put an L and a seven together and you get something close to square, right? Let's not be L7, come and learn to dance. Now here's a fun fact. The L7 line of Wooly Bully is where the all-female punk band L7 actually got their name. Wooly Bully was recorded at Phillips Recording Service 
uh, in Memphis, a studio owned by the man himself, Sam Phillips, established in 1958. Uh, that studio actually took the place of the historic Sun Studios where you know Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash and Roy Orbison laid down their, their tracks, their first tracks. While Phillips' recording service enjoyed some success, including the hit Lonely Weekends by Charlie Rich, uh, Sam Phillips eventually stepped back from the music business and sold Sun Records. Uh, it happened in the late 60s. Oh, now, the musical arrangement of Wooly Bully follows a classic 12-bar blues progression. Sam the Sham highlighted the song's Tex-Mex vibe by counting out the rhythm in both Spanish and English, shouting uno, dos, one, two, tres, cuatro, along with a catchy organ riff and a lively tenor saxophone solo right in the middle. Uno, dos, one, two, tres, cuatro. Sam recalled that the countdown wasn't even part of the original plan. He said, you know, I was just goofing around and I counted it off in Tex-Mex and it really blew everyone away. Honestly, I wanted it taken off the record altogether. Sam and the Pharaohs did three takes, each one a little bit different, uh, but the producer, Stan Kessler, who Sam vigorously sparred with on whether to keep the countdown on the recording, ended up preferring the first take. It's usually the one that works. So that's what they went for for the final mix to master version. Now the Mexican rhythm played a significant role in bringing that sound into the mainstream. While songs like Tequila and La Bamba paved the way in the 50s, you know, Wooly Bully might just be the bridge that connects those classics to the later hit Macarena. Uh, U2 even borrowed this idea when they incorporated the Spanish canon for their song Vertigo. Like many songs from that era, Wooly Bully was short and sweet. The 45 clocked in at like two minutes and 21 seconds, and it isn't shy about embracing pure silliness. A lot of that rollicking comes straight from Sam himself though. True to his nickname, Sam the Sham, he might not be the strongest singer, but he more than makes up for it with his infectious energy. Uh, his performance is packed with screams and ad-libs, and of course a playful joking tone that perfectly complements the song's fun and whimsical vibe. Now, the lively tenor saxophone solo in Wooly Bully was played by the revered Butch Gibson, who came from little old Adamsville, Tennessee. Hey, drive, drive, drive. Now, if you do a quick Google search for any of the best rock and roll solos, you're always going to find Wooly Bully near the top. Um, it's on numerous lists. One of the most influential saxophone solos of the rock era. I mean, it's hard to deny the spirit that the sax performance adds to the party in a major way. I mean, that solo doesn't make you want to get up and dance. You might want to check your pulse. It's amazing. <music> Wooly Bully marked the beginning of Sam the Sham and the Pharaoh's journey to fame, and it quickly became their biggest hit. That undeniably catchy tune took the world by storm, surpassing even the Holy Gully dance, uh, the, the craze that it was fashioned after. It sold over 3 million copies and it reached an impressive number two on the Billboard Hot 100 during the week of June 5th, 1965. The only songs keeping it from the top spot were the Beach Boys Help Me Rhonda and uh, the Supremes Back in My Arms Again. But not back in my arms again. Now, in addition to his top 40 success in the U.S., Wooly Bully climbed to number 31 on the Hot Rhythm and Blues singles chart, and it soared to number two on the Canadian singles chart. I just couldn't get to number one. I mean, the song has landed a very notable place in music history, becoming the first American record to sell a million copies during the British invasion, blending the British rock sound with traditional Mexican-American Junto rhythms. Quite an amazing feat, but the song's achievements, they don't stop there. The fact that the single peaked at number two is a very significant one because the single would ultimately outrank all those heavy hitters that I mentioned in the beginning of this episode. I mean, the song's popularity, it was so big, it spent 18 weeks on the Hot 100, huge for back then. That was the longest for any song in 1965. It even snagged a Grammy Award nomination, very impressive for a so-called novelty hit. Billboard magazine honored Wooly Bully as the number one song of the year despite it never actually reaching the top spot on the weekly Hot 100 chart. That remarkable achievement would 
it wouldn't be replicated for a long time. Actually, 2000 when Faith Hills Breathe, then Lifehouses, uh, Hanging by a Moment, did it in 2001, and Dua Lipa did it in, uh, a couple of years ago. All of which were songs that ended the year as the number one song of the year without ever reaching the top of the charts. Bullet, bullet. Bullet, bullet. Watch it now, watch it, watch it, watch it. Eddie and the Hot Rods gave Wooly Bully a shot in the UK back in 1976, but it didn't make it onto the charts. Uh, Joe Strummer even gave it a nod in the live version of the Clash's hit Capital Radio, which you can find on their album Live From Here to Eternity. Songs also popped up in a, a ton of films, ton of movies. You can catch it in the opening titles of Bandits of Milan. Uh, as well as more American Graffiti, The Hollywood Nights, Big Bully, The Rookie, and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Great use there. It's made appearances in classics like Full Metal Jacket, Splash, Scrooge, Happy Gilmore, Scooby-Doo 2, Encino Man, and Mr. Holland's Opus, among others. And of course, we can't forget the Chipmunks Adventure, where it's performed by the greatest studio manipulated singers of all time, Alvin the Chipmunks. And mid-2018, Woolworths in Australia started using Wooly Bully in their Why I Shop at Woolies TV ads. Get your Woolies worth with thousands of prices dropped across the store. Given that many punk artists drew inspiration from rebellious 60s garage rock, it's not surprising that some have taken a crack at Wooly Bully. Uh, one of the coolest punk covers, Joan Jett and the Black Hearts in 1980. Of course, the boss Bruce Springsteen had a blast performing a rendition of Wooly Bully at the Harley Davidson Festival in the beer capital of America. And you know, Bruce Springsteen's made it a regular part of his set on multiple tours. You might just say it's the most respected novelty song ever recorded. Following the wild prosperity of Wooly Bully, Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs released four singles that didn't connect with radio or the buying public. Of those four, only Ring Dang Do cracked the top 40, stalling at number 33 on the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, this happened in late 65. All I want is a ring dang do. Eventually, Sam the Sham put together a new lineup of the Pharaohs, and they recaptured some of the fun-spirited nature of Wooly Bully when they recorded Little Red Riding Hood. That song actually matched the peak of Wooly Bully. It went to number two during the week of August 6, 1966. Hey there, Little Red Riding Hood. Now, by the end of the 60s, the novelty worn off for Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. Actually, in 1970, Sam decided to go solo. By 1971, he released an Atlantic album titled Sam, Hard and Heavy. He even wrote the liner notes for it and ended up winning a Grammy Award for Best Album Notes in 1972. They actually did have a category for that back in the day. Very cool. Uh, the album featured some incredible talent, including Dwayne Allman. Uh, he was on guitar, the Dixie Flyers, and the Memphis Horns. And then in 74, Sam formed a new band. Fast forward to the late 70s, and Sam was teaming up with baritone saxophonist Joe Sunsiri and uh, his New Orleans-based band. In the early 80s, he collaborated with Ry Cooter and Freddie Fender on the soundtrack for Jack Nicholson's film, The Border. Just the border line. Then in 2009, the original 1965 release of Wooly Bully on the Phillips MGM recording label by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. In 2016, Sam was inducted into the Memphis Music Hall of Fame, recognition that he was deeply proud of. With the Sam the Sham moniker long, long gone, Sam left the music business and moved to Mexico. He's worked as an interpreter and as a, a mate on a small commercial boat in the Gulf of Mexico, different boats. Uh, Sam later embraced a new path in religion and charity. He's actually been teaching the Bible to prisoners and even working as an interpreter for healthcare ministries in South America. Now these days, in his late 80s, although he no longer sings about creatures with big horns and woolly jaws, he's still making waves as a motivational speaker and as a poet. I may have drifted too far this time. So sad to crush a flower. Now along those lines, I discovered something really interesting about Domingo Samudio, the man everyone referred to as Sam the Sham. 
His songs with the pharaohs may have been comical and quirky, performing them with campy robes and a turban, but there was a serious spiritual side of this artist that also came out on stage. Actually, Butch Gibson, who executed that iconic sax riff of Wooly Bully, revealed that at the height of their popularity, as Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, Sam used to close out their concert saying a few heartfelt words of wisdom over the microphone on stage to the audience. Here's one of those passages that Sam expressed to the crowd. I quote, that old clock on the wall done caught up with us all. We're going to roll out of here like a hole in a donut. And remember, you got to be yourself or else you'll wind up by yourself. And like the old gypsy woman told me, life is short, talk is cheap, don't make promises you cannot keep. Words of wisdom from the mighty Sam the Sham. You got it. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Make sure to leave us a comment about Sam the Sham of the Pharaohs and this classic novel to sing along, Wooly Bully. One of the great songs, garage rock songs of the 60s. Al sold the Beatles and the Stones, baby. Pretty cool. Let us know your memories of this song. What do you think it means? Is it dirty? I think it's not. It's like Louie Louie where people have made up things. But let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you. It's part of our community. Make sure to pick up your, uh, your t-shirt. Forgot what it was called, a t-shirt. <laughs> At 80stees.com, you, you can get that link below. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.